Mr. President, when Donald Trump spoke to his convention, he talked about the security threats. Uh, he talked. He painted a very dark picture. Now there's been a terrorist attack in Germany. Right. Doesn't that suggest he's right about the darkness? No, it doesn't. Uh, terrorism is a real threat, uh, and nobody knows that better than me. I've been spending uh, most of my days over the last seven and a half years uh, coordinating our intelligence, our military, our diplomatic efforts to crush organizations like Al Qaeda and now ISIL. Uh, it is going to be an ongoing threat for some time, but uh, what we've been able to do, I think, is to build coalitions with other countries to make sure that rather than have 180,000 troops uh, overseas uh, fighting a, uh, a non-state actor, that we've got special forces and intelligence assets and local partners, and ISIL is being defeated in Syria and Iraq, but we're going to have circumstances in which small cells, individuals, uh, are going to be able to do some harm to innocent people. And we've got to do everything we can to prevent it. One of the best ways of preventing it is making sure that we don't divide our own country, uh, that we don't succumb to fear, that we don't sacrifice our values, uh, and uh, that we send a very strong signal uh, to uh, the world and to uh, every American citizen that we're in this together. Explain how we would sacrifice our values specifically by being divided. Well, look, if we start engaging in the kinds of proposals that we've heard from Mr. Trump or some of his surrogates like Mr. Gingrich, uh, where we start suggesting that we would apply religious tests to who could come in here, that we are screening Muslim Americans differently than we would others, uh, then uh, we are betraying that very thing that makes America exceptional. And that, by the way, uh, has helped to insulate us from some of the worst uh, uh, you know, uh, patterns of terrorist attacks because the Muslim American here, uh, community here feels deeply American and deeply committed to upholding the rule of law. And, uh, working with law enforcement and rejecting intolerance and extremism uh, that's represented by the perversions of Islam that uh, ISIL is sending out through the internet or carrying out uh, in the Middle East. But that requires leaders, political leaders, uh, religious leaders, business leaders, all of us, uh, to send a very clear signal that uh, we are not going to be divided in that fashion, and uh, I think the, the kinds of rhetoric that we've heard too often uh, from Mr. Trump and others uh, is ultimately uh, helping to do ISIL's workforce. He was uh, the chief birther in America, questioning whether you, what is it, what's your reaction to the fact that he's the nominee of the Republican Party? <laughs> well, I, I think... I think it says something about what's happened to the Republican Party over the course of the last 8, 10, 15 years. Um, if, if you think about what a Bob Dole or a Jim Baker or a Howard Baker or a Dick Luger or a Colin Powell stood for, yeah, they were conservative, they were concerned about uh, limited government. and balancing budgets and making sure we had a strong defense, uh, but uh, they also understood that uh, our system of government requires compromise, that Democrats weren't the enemy, uh, that uh, the way our government works requires us to listen to each other. Um, and. You know, that's not the kind of politics that we've seen practiced, uh, I think, all too often. Um, you know, things that Mr. Trump have said aren't that different from what a number of members of Congress in the Republican caucus in the House or Senate have said or local officials have said uh, across the country. And so, uh, and, and certainly all of this is, is magnified by uh, a network of talk radio 
and uh, and cable news that uh, you know is putting out some of the pretty crazy conspiracy theories. The good news is that's not where ultimately the majority of the American people are at. The bad news is is that we need a healthy two-party system in order for us to tackle the real problems that are out there. Do you think the majority of American people feel safe, that the world is safer after? Well, I think right now we've gone through a, a really tough month, um, and that happens sometimes. Uh, you know, we've had a terrorist attack in uh, Orlando, although it does not appear externally motivated, uh, but a deranged man killing uh, uh, scores of people. Uh, you've had um, the, the tragedies that happened in Minnesota and Baton Rouge, police officers t targeted uh, both in Dallas and Baton Rouge, uh, and the, uh, the, the senseless violence that took place in Nice. And, and if that's what you're consuming, you know, if that's what you, you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis for the last month, I think it's understandable that people uh, are concerned. What I think is important for leaders to do is to uh, let the American people know they are right to be concerned. We've got to make sure that uh, our police officers are uh, protected in a very tough job, that our criminal justice system operates the way it should and, and without bias that we're doing everything we can to go after terrorists, but it's also important for um, the American people to remember that our crime rate in this country is much lower than it was in the 80s or the 90s or uh, when I first took office, that uh, immigration rates are substantially lower than they were when Ronald Reagan was president, that um, you know, as serious as these terrorist attacks are, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, the American people are significantly more safe now than they were uh, uh, before all the work that we've done since 9-11. And so maintaining that perspective, I think, is absolutely critical. And, and trying to fan fears simply uh, to score political points, I think, is, uh, is not in the best interest of the American people. You had a very strong reaction to Donald Trump's uh, criticism of you for not using the phrase radical Islam. Mm. But in 2008, when you were a candidate for president, you did use the term radical Islam. Why did you stop? You know, th this is uh, an interesting example of where something that shouldn't be an issue gets magnified. The fact of the matter is, is that I've never been politically uh, or, or particularly concerned with uh, the phrase what I've been more concerned about is how do we stop violent uh, extremists from killing us. The reason that I haven't used the particular phrase radical Islam on a regular basis is because in talking to Muslim allies, in talking to the Muslim American community here, that was being heard as if we were uh, ascribing to crazy groups like ISIL or Al-Qaeda, uh, the mantle of Islam. And since we need them as allies, I think it's useful for us to listen to how the President of the United States' words and messages are being received. Uh, because if we're going to defeat those organizations, we need help from the billion plus Muslims in this world uh, so that they can help root out this perversion of Islam that's taken place. Speaking of allies, Donald Trump had a response and a view about NATO. He said yes. that if one of the Baltic, Baltic, uh, Baltic nations were attacked, that he might not defend uh, unless they were paying their dues. Now, you've talked about free riders, yeah. countries that rely on U.S. defense without doing, pulling their share. So why, are, why aren't those similar thoughts, if not, you know, <laughs> playing out a little bit differently, but well, the same well, thought? Well, I, I, I think that anybody who's been paying attention knows there's a big difference between challenging our European allies to keep up uh, their defense spending, uh, particularly at a time when Russia's been more aggressive, and saying to them, you know what, we might not abide by the central tenant of the most important alliance uh, in the history of the world, 
one that was built by Democrats and Republicans and has been uh, a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy since the end of World War II. Uh, and the, you know, for Mr. Trump, who has in the past suggested that uh, America's weak and not looking out for its allies, to then maybe not have enough information or understanding uh, to, to go out and say that uh, America might not stand by its solemn commitment uh, to uh, protect uh, those same allies who stood with us after 9-11 when we were attacked, um, I, I think is, is an indication of the lack of preparedness uh, that uh, he's been displaying when it comes to foreign policy. Switching topics to talk about race in America. You wrote a book about race and identity in America. If you were a, a young man now growing up in America, how would that book be different? Well, you know, it's a great question. In some ways, I'm able to see it through the eyes of my daughters. Now, obviously, they've got a, a unique circumstance having grown up in the White House. Uh, so they're in, in no way uh, typical of uh, black kids or Latino kids or uh, other uh, ethnic uh, minorities around the country. But in some ways, I'd be more optimistic. I, I look at um, the way in which my daughters take for granted their right to aspire to anything. Uh, and I, I think about the way in their interactions with their white friends. Uh, they have a common culture and a common language and common perspectives that were far more segregated even when I was growing up, and that wasn't that long ago. Um, so so in, in a lot of ways, I would feel more hopeful. Um, ironically, I think precisely because things have gotten better, um, what I've heard from younger African Americans is more shock about uh, the images and the videos from Minnesota or Baton Rouge. Um, and what I've had to say to them is that you know, s s these issues are not new. They've been there c and come up periodically for quite some time. What's new is smartphones and videos, and this actually gives us a, a greater opportunity to try to tackle these problems. In your book you wrote about when you went to Africa, you said that it was great because you had the experience of not being watched. Yeah. I would think now that as a young African-American male, the feeling of being watched with having watched all those videos would be more acute. Well, I'll be honest with you. Um, and, and I talked about this a little bit at, at a town hall that I did uh, in the aftermath of, of the Dallas shootings. Um, th there aren't a lot of African-American males who haven't at some point in their lives uh, been subject to additional scrutiny or suspicion because of their race. Um, that, that's just a, 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 a common experience that uh, many of us share. But I will tell you that um, it's, it's a lot better now than it was. And uh, in, that doesn't mean that we can be complacent about it. In fact, what I've tried to encourage uh, young African Americans who I speak to, um, and that includes some of these protesters in the aftermath of Minnesota or Ferguson, what I've encouraged them to, to, to do is to think about how can they bring about real change and that involves legislation, it involves changing police practices, and that involves doing your homework, sitting down and negotiating. Um, it, it involves showing respect for uh, the challenges that uh, police officers have in protecting us. Um, so it, as, as tough a stretch as we've gone through over the last month or the last year or the last two years around these issues, I actually see more constructive dialogue taking place and more concrete proposals and 
police departments taking this more seriously uh, than they ever have in the past, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. I want to talk to you about the skills it takes to be president. Yeah. In about 72 hours recently, you had to grieve in Dallas with the families of, of uh, five police officers. You had to monitor a terrorist attack in Nice. You also had to monitor a coup attempt and then what people are calling a purge in Turkey. Given that that's what a president has to deal with, what attributes should we be looking for in the candidates who are running for president to handle those kinds of days? Well, well let's start off with the fact that I'm biased. <laughs> sure. Right? Uh, but you're a man of reason, I so am, you will I be am, able to make so, the case so, regardless. So I think I, I, I'll, I'll try to be as objective as I can. Um, and, and I've thought about this. You know, the first thing uh, I think the American people should be looking for is somebody that can build a team and create a culture uh, that uh, knows how to organize it and, and move the ball down the field. And um, the reason for that is because no matter how good you are as president, you are overseeing two million people and a trillion dollar plus budget. And uh, or, uh, the largest organization on earth. And you can't do it all by yourself. And so you are reliant on really talented, hard work and skilled people and making sure they're all moving in the same direction. Um, and doing it without drama and not worrying as much about you know, who's getting credit and, uh, and, and creating all those good habits inside of an organization I think are, are critical. The second thing I think uh, a president needs is um, a sense of discipline, uh, personal discipline in, in terms of doing your homework and knowing your subject matter and being able to stay focused, um, helping to make sure the, the team in the White House is disciplined because you are responding constantly to unexpected events and you've got to be able to just work those through in rapid, uh, effective fashion, but also not lose track of your overall goals. Uh, the third is you need vision about where you want to take the country. And you've got to know ahead of time enough about the economy and foreign policy and American history and you know, our system of government so that when you stake out a, a, a vision that uh, we need more economic equality in this country, uh, you're just not making assertions, you're actually able to drive policy uh, forward uh, to, to achieve the vision. And then the final thing is You have to really care about the American people, um, not not in not in the abstract, not uh, as a as boilerplate, uh, but you have to really every single day want to do your best for them. Because if you don't have that sense uh, grounding you, you will be buffeted and and blown back and forth by polls and interest groups and voices whispering in your heads and, 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 and you will lose your center of gravity. You will lose your moral compass. But if, if you really are here because, man, that, I want to make sure that woman who, who's working really hard is getting paid a decent wage. I, I really want that family with a sick kid to, to make sure they're, they're, they're not losing their home. Then, uh, even when things go bad, and there are going to be times in this job where things go bad, you, you have a frame of reference. You, you know why you're doing it, and that means also that you can push through and do some things that may not be politically popular initially. In 2008, a lot of your supporters said, look at the way he ran his campaign. If he runs the presidency like his campaign, he's going to be in good shape. Why isn't that true for Donald Trump, who's run a pretty remarkable campaign, being 16 other politicians? Well. Uh, in 2008, I, I don't think they were referring merely to the fact that I had won. <laughs> uh, I, I think they were referring to the fact that we built a really good team. We were really well organized. We were 
we had a, uh, a great culture uh, that um, there, there wasn't a whiff of scandal to how we approached uh, uh, getting elected. Um, we told the truth. Uh, so there, there, were, there were a bunch of things that, uh, that uh, hopefully showed the kind of White House I'd run, and I think we've been pretty consistent in, in, uh, in, in doing that. Um, I, I do think that the body of work of a person matters, um, and I would say that, uh, and I've said this before, I will say again, since you opened, uh, opened this line of questioning, I genuinely believe that there's never been a candidate better prepared for the presidency than Hillary Clinton. Not, now, not now that, Eisenhower, not George well, Herbert Walker Bush, those are pretty. Well, I, did, I said more prepared. I, I didn't say uh, that uh, they were, uh, you know, chop liver. I mean, you know, head, uh, heading up uh, uh, the Allied Forces is pretty, pretty good uh, training for the presidency. Uh, and I'm huge admirers of both Eisenhower and uh, uh, Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, in fact, I think that uh, George H. W. Bush is one of the most underrated presidents we've had. Uh, I think he was and is a really good man. But the skill sets that Hillary has are similar to many of the skill sets that they had. Experience in government. Experience in uh, working with a wide range of people solving big, difficult problems, uh, familiarity with the world. Um, you know, I, the, the truth is is that uh, Hillary and I have become friends, but we're not bosom buddies. We, you know, we, we, we don't go vacationing together. I think that I've got a pretty uh, clear-eyed sense of both her strengths and her weaknesses. And what I would say would be that this is somebody who knows as much about domestic and foreign policy as anybody, is tough as nails, is motivated by uh, what's best for America and ordinary people, understands that in this democracy that we have, uh, it, things don't always happen as fast as we'd like, and it requires compromise and grinding it out. Um, She's not always flashy, and they're better speech makers, but she knows her stuff. And more than anything, that is what is ultimately required uh, to do a good job in this, uh, in this office. Let me stick with that line of questioning. You built a team at the beginning, and you were really clear about transparency. Yeah. You were going to change the White House and the tr yeah. be transparent yeah. to send a message to the country who felt let down by people. Right. She set up an email server that was neither in the spirit or the letter of that transparency. That's no small thing based on the, what you told everybody about transparency at the beginning. Right. And, and I think that she would acknowledge she made a mistake. Um, but what I also think is true is, is that if you've been in the public eye for decades at the highest levels of scrutiny, folks are going to find some mistakes you make. I've made mistakes. I don't know any president or public official at her level who aren't going to look back and say, I should have done something like that differently. But what I would also say is that the consistency with which she has devoted her life to trying to make sure that kids get health care and a good education and that uh, you know, families are getting a fair break if they're working hard, and that America upholds its best traditions of foreign policy. Uh, on the big stuff, she's gotten it right. But if you make mistakes, you've got to admit them quick and be, come clean. Well, you, you said that about the, your, the Reverend Wright. You, get, you said afterwards, you said, you know what, we learned. You've got to get this done, and you've got to. Yeah. So that yeah. wasn't. Well, look, uh, you know, I, I think that. Uh, Joe Biden and I always used to joke uh, because people would see a pattern that uh, our approval ratings would go real low until then we got closer to the election and then people had to make a choice. And uh, Joe's favorite saying was, don't compare me 
to the Almighty, compare me to the alternative. And ultimately, government is a human enterprise. You know, none of us are perfect. And this job, by definition, <laughs> leader of the free world, President of the United States of America, the, the most powerful country and the wealthiest country and most influential country in the history of the world, it's a big job. And it, it has gotten more and more complicated. And the speed and the pace at which you're moving is different. And if you think about, now that we know our history, about the errors of even our greatest presidents, of FDR, or JFK, or Ronald Reagan, or uh, Harry Truman, then what you realize is that ultimately each of us who occupy this office, including me, uh, are going to in some ways, in some areas, fall short of the ideal. Um, and I promise you, if you occupy this job long enough, you're, you're acu acutely aware of it. You're, you're painfully aware. I, I, there, aren't, I, there isn't a day where I don't say to myself, I wish I could have done this just a little better. I, I wish I could explain to the American people this issue just a, a, a little bit more effectively. I, I, I wish that I had some perfect scheme that could bring about an end to the, the, the crisis in Syria quicker so that, be, because I'm seeing the consequences of uh, events that are unfolding all around the world. But, the, but what keeps you going is the fact that uh, you're doing your best, that you've, you, are, you have put together a team of people that could not be working harder or be smarter or more effective. And um, what you also know is, is that uh, at the end of the day, our democracy works because it's not reliant just on one person, but it's, uh, it's a process of self-government where we're all involved in making things a little bit better. FDR and Lincoln were both uh, talented at um, letting both sides of an issue think that they agreed with both of them. <laughs> is honesty overrated as a presidential quality? It's interesting. I, I actually think that honesty is not overrated. I think it is absolutely necessary uh, because the trust you have with the American people is um, currency that can get depleted and is hard to build back up. What I also believe, though, is that um, the issues we deal with are so complicated and uh, trying to uh, move all the pieces together to, to, to move this huge ocean liner that is the U.S. government uh, means that uh, sometimes holding your tongue, sometimes letting things play themselves out, uh, knowing uh, not just when to act but also to when to hold back and, and see how things are playing out so that you can pick and choose the time to do what needs to be done because uh, the moment may not be ripe yet. Uh, you know, those, those things I think are a matter of feel. You know, uh, Lincoln and FDR were masters at it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not in, in their league, but hopefully after seven and a half years I've gotten a little better at it. Wilson said a president can be as big a man as he wants to be. Other presidents, Reagan, Clinton, Bush, all said, the thing you learn as president is you can't do all, you can't do as much as you thought you could, and maybe even it's a pretty constraining job. Which one of the two of them is right? Um, the, the founders designed our system of government so that we didn't have a dictator, <laughs> so that one person, uh, no matter how benevolent their intentions, uh, couldn't just yank this massive country of ours in, uh, in a single direction. And I'm sure glad they did it because uh, the track record of uh, you know, despots uh, and you know, autocrats and, and big men who, who think they know better uh, is not good around the world. The, uh, I do think that um, in a modern world that is moving really fast, 
at a time when, for a bunch of reasons, because of political gerrymandering and big money in politics and uh, the, the dividing up of the media into the Fox News world and the you know, Huffington Post world, uh, that uh, moving the machinery of government is harder. Uh, the speed of it is tougher. And so uh, you, have to, you have to have a, a, le a certain level of endurance and just stick to itness in order to be effective. This is something that I know Hillary Clinton has. She, she grinds it out, and it's not always pretty. But that, in this environment, oftentimes is w uh, what's most effective in actually getting stuff done. I, you, you think about the Affordable Care Act. Now, I know it's still controversial. There's still a, a bunch of public opinion that doesn't like it. But the truth is, when you look at what we said we were going to do and what we've done, 20 million people have health insurance, despite basically every Republican official around the country saying they're opposed to it. 20 million people have health insurance. The people who had health insurance on the job have better protections than they did before. It's all cost trillions of dollars less than uh, anticipated. Health care costs. Uh, have not gone up as fast as they were before this was passed. And think about just how messy and, <laughs> and hard it was to get there, and the fact that even now, when most objective assessments are that the things worked, uh, it's still subject to controversy. It, it gives you a sense of how, in this environment, in today's politics, um, uh, you know, Building the sort of consensus that FDR could with a fireside chat, um, you know, having the ability that JFK did to sort of stand above it all and um, not ever get dragged down into the muck, um, to not ha you know have sort of uh, what happens in some obscure agency that you don't know anything about suddenly blow up and become this. Uh, you know, manufactured uh, controversy for weeks on end. Uh, you know, those days are over. They're, they're, it's a little bit like uh, the shift uh, that has taken place uh, between being president now and when Teddy Roosevelt could go off to Yellowstone with one Secret Service agent and go camping for a month, <laughs> or FDR could take a ship uh, up to Nova Scotia and, uh, Drinking brandy with uh, Winston Churchill in the middle of World War II, and uh, you sound I, envious. I do. Uh, yeah, it's a different different environment. We're getting the hook, but what's the one piece of uh, advice that your predecessor gave you that worked, that was really useful? Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, George W. Bush, despite you know obviously very different uh, political philosophies. Um, is a, is a really good man and, and uh, has been very gracious to me and to Laura, and has been gracious to Michelle. Uh, the, the whole family has been terrific. Um, probably two useful pieces of advice. Uh, uh, the first uh, piece of advice uh, was um, trust yourself uh, and uh, know that um, ultimately, regardless of the day-to-day -day news cycles uh, and the noise uh, that the American people need uh, their president to succeed, uh, regardless of political party, uh, which I thought was very generous of. Uh, the second piece of advice is uh, always use Purell hand sanitizer, because uh, if you don't, you're going to get a lot of a lot of colds because you shake a lot of hands. All right, news you can use. Absolutely. Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, I enjoyed. It.